The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 10476 in the name of Graham Simpson on Save the Green Belt. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Those members who wish to speak in the debate, please press the request to speak, be, speak buttons. Now and I call on Graham Simpson to open the debate. Mr Simpson, please. Thank you very much. Um, can I thank the members who signed my motion and so allowed it to be debated? And uh, I thank all those who will take part today. I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to the representatives of the campaign, Save Woodhall and Faskin, and others who've made the trip through to be in the public gallery today. It's customary for members to disclose if they have an interest in the subject of the debate. Well, here is mine. I love the green belt. This debate comes about because of a proposal to seek planning permission to build on Greenbelt land between Calderbank and Carnborough in North Lanarkshire, and I accept the Minister won't be able to talk about that. The area includes land owned by the daughters of the late Willie Whitelaw, passed to them by their father before he died. There is a beautiful woodland with many species of trees, the ruins of the former estate house and what's left of the Monklands Canal. The area is rich in history and heritage. It could and should be enhanced. Orchard Bray, the developers, say their plans, not submitted yet, would allow for that. They would also see 2,600 houses built in Greenbelt and effectively join Calderbank to Carnbro and then Airdrie. They also say they would leave woodlands on the Woodhall and Faskin estates intact. Well, that's because with the help of the Woodland Trust, I managed to secure a tree preservation order through North Lanarkshire Council covering the entire area. Now, let's be honest here, where fortunes can be made by the simple granting of planning permission, trees are not high in people's thought processes. So that TPO was vital. Green belts are more than just a boundary between rural and urban areas. Open spaces provide habitats for wildlife and are ideal places for walking and other recreational pursuits. They provide a natural ecosystem, such as water treatment and air quality. They're also important in preventing floods. Now, as the party spokesman for housing and communities, I'm fully aware of the pressure on existing housing stock and the need to build more affordable homes to meet demands. But they need to be in the right places, and this isn't one of them. There are numerous health benefits brought about by walk in the countryside. Don't just take my word for it. Local GP David Walker, an appropriate surname, who serves the area around Calderbank and Calm Bro, spoke passionately about the health benefits, physical and mental, of the Green Belt at a recent public meeting. And he told me last week, quotes, we're in the midst of an obesity epidemic. Scottish government figures state that in 2016, 65% of adults over 16 were overweight and 29% were obese. These figures are increased from the previous 10 years. The benefits of exercise are many, particularly in green space. Fine words. He went on to say that exercise is the first line of treatment for many conditions, in particular obesity, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, cardiac rehab and mental health issues. The latter particularly benefits from exposure to green space. Dr. Walker concluded, quotes, once green space is gone from a community, it's extremely difficult to recreate. We must do all we can to protect the health of future generations. He's not a lone voice in this. The Lancet recently published a paper which claims exposure to green space can help lower mortality rates and a joint study by Glasgow and St Andrews University it illustrated the price, priceless value of the green belt when it stated environments that promote good health might be crucial in the fight to reduce health inequalities. This means that in general people living in poorer areas are more likely to be unhealthy and die earlier. However, the research found that living near parks, woodland or other open spaces help reduce these inequalities regardless of social class. All this is backed by the World Health Organization in their report on urban green spaces, which concluded the evidence shows 
that urban green space has health benefits, particularly for economically deprived communities, children, pregnant women and senior citizens. It's therefore essential that all populations uh, have adequate access to green space. Last week in this chamber, I asked Fiona Hislop if she agreed that having a country park and canal heritage trail at Calder Blank was worth investigating. She agreed heritage trails can bring a social and economic uplift to the areas they serve and has to be kept informed of any developments. Uh, so I'll keep her informed. We must do all we can to protect our environment from being destroyed. It's up to this generation to make sure the next one is afforded the same chance to enjoy these urban woodlands and enjoy both the physical and mental benefits they bring to the community they serve. We've got an opportunity to protect Scotland's green spaces and heritage through the planning bill currently going through Parliament. At the moment, it's silent on the environment. Rest assured, I'll be tabling an amendment or two to make sure precious green space is protected through the planning system and that we enshrine in law protection for historic and locally important buildings. I don't want this left to secondary legislation and I'm happy to discuss my ideas with the Minister. We need a plan-led system which ensures that when an area is designated as Greenbelt and a council is fulfilling its housing targets, that speculative applications that ring alarm bells for communities just can't happen. As I close, can I thank again the local campaigners for their tireless work and to members from across the political divide for their support. My colleague Margaret Mitchell will be speaking later, but I'd particularly like to thank Richard Leonard for his backing right from the start of this campaign. I hope that those who are taking part in today's debate will offer their backing to my constituents and all others fighting their own corner across the country to protect what we have. As Dr. Walker said, when the green belt is gone, it's gone for good. Thank you, thank you very much. I now call uh, Richard Lennon. I understand, Mr. Lennon, you have an important meeting after us, uh, therefore understand why you can't stay for the rest of the debate. Richard Lennon, please, and uh, he will be followed by Richard Lyle. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, forbearance, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I apologise again for having to leave early. Uh, but can I begin by thanking Graeme Simpson uh, for securing what is a very timely debate because it raises some profoundly important questions not just about green spaces, but about where power lies in our society. The proposal to concrete over the green belt between Calderbank and Canbro in North Lanarkshire has provoked not only local but national outrage. And it's clear that with this proposal, like so many others, that on one side is ranged big money interests, whilst on the other are ranged local people and local communities, resisting the robbery of a natural asset an asset which is of historical importance with significant ecological value and great recreational benefit. And they are joined by the democratically elected and accountable local council whose local development plan has reasserted just recently this green space as green belt, not for development. It was clear that the first proposal of application of notice submitted on behalf of the developer to North Lanarkshire Council in 2016 to build 3,000 houses and retail and other commercial uses was in direct breach of this local development plan that kept this land in the green belt. And now we see that a revised proposal of application notice has been submitted to include 1,600 private homes and 1,000 dwellings described as, I quote, social, affordable, and market rent properties. But you see, this is what commonly happens. Developers seeking to maximize stakeholder profit pitch in first of all with a proposal to maximize their gains, then scale proposals back to make them appear more palatable to local councillors who, for understandable reasons, want to see the building of council houses houses for social rent and affordable homes. But we have seen in other parts of Scotland 
that once developments of this scale and this size are underway, the developers then seek to squeeze more houses in, usually claiming that the market has changed since planning permission was granted and seeking to reduce, in most instances, their contribution under Section 75 agreements and claiming the whole pro project would be in jeopardy unless they are able to build more and contribute less. So this debate is, in the end, about where power lies. We have also seen time and time again the democratic decisions of local planning bodies made up of elected councillors overturned by the Planning and Environmental Appeals Division of the Scottish Government, which appoints an unelected reporter. There is something quite wrong in my mind with a system where the decisions of local elected councillors can be overridden by an unelected central government appointed official. So this is also in the end about where the power lies. So there is a broader lesson here for local communities across Scotland. Stand firm and fight and keep fighting and keep pressing this parliament. And there is a lesson here for members of this parliament. When we consider the planning bill before us over the coming months, let us look at the right of appeal and let us consider equality of treatment. And let us consider what we can do in this parliament to re-empower local government, to revitalise local democracy and promote the ballot box over the boardroom and in so doing redistribute where the power lies. It's been a privilege to speak in this debate, to work with the campaigners locally. I admire their determined fighting spirit and their enduring faith and mine that in the end, organised people can overcome organised money. Thank you, Mr Leonard. It can can I just say gently uh, uh, to uh, public uh, in the gallery, you're not permitted to clap. Do you, I know why you want to, but you're not permitted to clap, uh, uh, um, the speakers. Uh, and I move on and call Richard Lyle to be followed by Margaret Mitchell. Mr Lyle, please. Thank you, President Officer. Can I firstly thank Graeme Simpson for securing this debate? I am certain of the immense importance of our environment, and it's impossible to understate the significance of its conservation. So what is the goal? but it must have its proper limits. It's well known that Scotland's population is rising. The number of households around Scotland's four main cities are projected to rise by up to 24% over the next 25 years. Top of this, 150,000 households do not have anywhere to live and are on waiting lists. Graham Simpson and I attended a meeting with North Lancashire Council last Monday, where he and I pressed the council new house building and their waiting lists. In addition to the rising need Homes in our major cities and growing waiting lists, Homes for Scotland reports that we need at least 100,000 houses of all tenures in order to meet the demand. Whether we want to acknowledge it or not, the fact remains. Families cannot live without a home. We must balance between looking after our environment and economic growth. Presiding officer, I should say that I find myself confused. Sorry, I don't have time. We have Mr Simpson's Tory counterparts in England constantly warning of a housing crisis in England, and that's something that must be done to relieve the suffering. They're threatening to remove the planning from English councils as not enough homes are being built in England. So where will they build them? On Greenbelt. Yes, yet Scottish Tories seem to be operating under a double standard. If they agree there is indeed a need for more housing, but wish to block any housing development in Greenbelt, then they must be either defying their party or they simply prefer homeless people to selective development. No, I'm sorry, I don't have time. Of course, the Europark, Europark development will not solve the housing need. If it's considered, it will add 3,000 3, new homes. 3,000 new homes where families can put down their roots, make their lives for themselves, lives that will include 1,100 new jobs if this project would, would create. Furthermore, it will generate an additional 126 million in household income for families who could come and settle and work in this area. It will bring much needed relief to our housing supply. Euro part would also bring £500 million of new investment to Scotland and Scottish businesses. I could go on and on. Over 200 acres of parkland will be retained. Investment in these opportunities will draw businesses to reinvest in their communities. I know that some may object if we allow developments of parts of Greenbelts. We'll be on a slippery slope to eventually losing them altogether. 
And this concern is, is uh, maybe well-founded, but firstly, no one in this chamber, as I have said, doesn't recognise the importance of conservation. Therefore, I must say again that we must strike a balance between the green belt and development. Some may say very well, but we should develop brown sites first. Of course, they should be developed, and they should have been. Half of the homes built in 2014-15 were on brownfield sites, and 199 hectares of previously used land were brought back into residential use in 2016. What this ob objection overlooks again is the fact there isn't simply enough brownfield sites to build all the homes which are required. And the truth is, many brownfield sites are contaminated or have difficult ground conditions. Rather than digging our heels and covering our ears, we need to have a rational discussion about best to maintain the delicate balance between growth and co conservation. We should have and should be having a national discussion regarding developing our green belt in towns and cities. In closing, I have to say to the Tory party, its members should stop trying to have their cake and eat it. Do you want economic upturn in Scotland or stagnation? I know what I want. I want homes, I want jobs, and I want prosperity for Scotland. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Mr Lyle. I call Margaret Mitchell, who followed by Andy Whiteman. Ms. Mitchell, Thank you, Deputy please. Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to participate in this debate and to save green belt land. And I thank my colleague, Graeme Simpson, for tabling the motion. The development in question is a controversial plan to build thousands of homes and amenities over a large swathe of green belt land. It will be built on a three mile square site containing fields and woods between the M8, Carnborough, Car Cairnhill and Calder Bank on the outskirts of Airdrie. This is made up of two estates, Woodhall and Faskin. The latter area is one my family has had a long association with as my father was born and brought up on Faskin Farm, where he lived until he was a young man. He smoke, spoke with great warmth of his boyfood, boyhood and the I idyllic freedom he had roaming the countryside there, along with his faithful companion, a collie named Kep. Whilst, thousand, whilst surrounded by urban development, this area of natural beauty has remained untouched for generations. Furthermore, it is of significant historical interest, boasting the Monklands Canal, which in the 19th century was one of the busiest in Britain, transporting one and a half million tonnes of coal and iron ore a year. There are also remains of the listed Woodhall Estate Country House and one of Scotland's earliest railways. Despite this, it is countryside now set to be destroyed and lost forever. The peace and serenity which hundreds of local people enjoy will be lost forever. And much of the flora and fauna will be lost forever to be replaced almost certainly by traffic congestion and pollution. And let not, let's not forget that this is green belt land that development threatens, along with other areas in North Lanarkshire, including the Douglas Support Estate, also referred to, uh, referred to as View Park Glen, which stretches from Coatbridge to View Park in Addingston. It's only thanks to the View, View Park Conservation Group that this site of immense historic interest, ranging from the Covenanters to w Winston Churchill, has not been completely consumed by developers. And the Green Belt in Steps is subject to the Horns Hill Gateside Farm development, which was rejected by North Lanarkshire Council, but has now been approved by the Scottish Government reporter, opening the floodgates to further development so that Steps, like other areas, is being slowly overwhelmed and consumed. Finally, presiding officer, these Green Belt areas have recognised health benefits and are known to locals as their green lung, assisting in their physical and mental well-being. With obesity reaching record levels, it is key to encourage, not discourage, exercise. And quite simply, the value of protecting these green belt areas cannot be overstated. So whilst, as Richard Lyle says, we need more new affordable social housing, brown sites should be developed. All too often, they're plundering green belt, belt land first as the most attractive to, be, to build on, and that simply 
unacceptable. And only if there's a compelling reason should Greenbelt areas such as the Faskin and Woodhall estates be considered for development. I pay tribute to the Save Woodhall and Faskin campaigners and pledge along with Graham and my MSP colleagues and councillors my wholehearted and continued support for their campaign. And I sincerely hope the Minister will here today recognise all brownfield sites must be exhausted before there's any possibility of de developing our precious green belt. Thank you. Uh, I call Andy Whiteman to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Mr Whiteman, please. Uh, thanks very much, Presiding Officer, and, and thanks to Graeme Simpson for uh, bringing this uh, members' debate. I'm grateful for emails that I've received from many constituents in relationship, not just to Woodhall and Faskine, but in fact, green belts and developments across Scotland, I think many of which are coming in, in, in response to the, to the planning uh, uh, bill. Um, I'm very sympathetic uh, with the campaign that's being run by Graeme Simpson's um, uh, constituents, uh, but I want to restrict my remarks to some more general points around uh, the Green Belt. The concept, of course, of Green Belts has been around a long time following the 1947 Planning Act. It provided an important means to curtail urban sprawl and ribbon development whilst encouraging more efficient use of the existing urban spaces. Now, in Lothian, in my region, we have the Edinburgh Green Belt, which is Scotland's oldest green belt, established 61 years ago by the local authority at the time. And then they had no formal uh, structure, so each local authority had to develop their own local policies uh, uh, around uh, the green belt and to incorporate what were considered to be uh, the boundaries of the green belt. But it's now covered by the South East uh, the CES plan, the Strategic Development Plan for the South East of Scotland. Strategic Development Plans, of course, are being proposed to be abolished. But whilst I commend the concept, I don't think uh, green belts are in fact fit for purpose. Uh, a belt or a ring is a hard concept that provides a hard edge to settlements. And ideas about planning across Europe have moved on since 1947. And if you visit cities and settlements in Germany in particular, Best practice now is not hard edges, it's wedges, it's long fingers of greenery in the hearts of cities moving out into the countryside so that the distinction between urban and rural, between brown and green is not so hard and it enables the maximum number of people living in settlements to enjoy and experience and benefit from uh, green spaces. Now in Edinburgh, with the economic growth that's projected, there are increasing pressures uh, on uh, the green belt. And I would just question, actually, in an Edinburgh context, a lot of the green belt is not green. It's actually brown. It's weeds. It's land that is held by speculators waiting for the day in which its land values will increase and they can take away a profit. Now, we want to see legislation that strengthens uh, the planning system, strengthens our ability to protect green spaces and the values it provides. I'm working with constituents here in Edinburgh, for example, uh, who, th who, who are being uh, served with eviction notices uh, to move them off farmland, which we would prefer to see as a food belt, which was part of the green belt, now zoned as a film studio under pressure from Scottish government, another speculative uh, development. And looking at the current planning bill, of course, there's nothing, as Graham since I think, mentioned on green belts. Although in section 10 of the bill, under simplified development zones, it's clear that ministers want to revoke section 54 of the 1997 Town Country Planning Act, which prevents simplified planning zones in approved green belts. And the current bill proposes that simplified development zones could be established in green belt areas to support, quote, town centre investment and regeneration. That's in the policy memorandum. I think we have to have a look at that. But the bill does contain some welcome uh, proposals around local place plans, although they're very ill-defined. So the wider issues raised by the member in his motion this morning relate to how the planning system works. And in too many cases right across Scotland, we find not only green belts, but we find developments that have been unanimously rejected by elected members of the planning authority, often then appealed by developers, upheld uh, on appeal, or in many cases rejected by reporters or ministers. And as we've been hearing in evidence on the planning bill, this undermines the shared ambition to have a front-loaded uh, uh, planning system. 
and therefore we will be bringing forward proposals to end the applicant's right of appeal, to strengthen the local development plan, to eliminate the speculative volume house building model, and to give local people, local planning authorities, much greater say in how land is developed across Scotland, including in Greenbelt. Finally, thank you again to Graeme Simpson for allowing me this opportunity uh, to air these thoughts. Thank you very much. I call Fulton McGregor to be followed by Monica Lennon, and Monica Lennon will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr McGregor, please. Thank you, President Officer. And can I thank Graeme Simpson for bringing this debate to the Chamber, a very important and timely debate. And can I offer an apology, uh, President Officer, to yourself? Uh, I had missed the original, uh, the start of Graeme's opening speech, because I was taking a young person to meet the First Minister. That's perfectly all right, because you did send us a note in advance. It was thank most you. appropriate. Thank you for that. I just wanted to declare it. Why is Greenbelt important? We've heard a wee bit about that. It's, it's important um, to have open space. It links in with the play agenda, the healthy lifestyle agenda, and it's very good for uh, physical and mental well-being. And uh, in, in the briefing that we get sent from the APRS, a survey in June last year found that 74.6% of people agree that Greenbelt should have stronger protection. And just this morning, it didn't get taken by the presiding officer. We didn't quite get to question 10, but I asked a general question um, on the protection for the Green Belt and Kevin Stewart's answer, which I've now got in written for him and can be found on the website, says the Scottish planning policy provides strong and flexible policy for Green Belts across Scotland. The bill won't change that policy, but aims to give it greater weight in decision making. So that reassures me that this Scottish Government takes Green Belt very seriously. And why wouldn't they? I, I, I'm going to make progress. I've got quite a lot to say. I've got a lot of local issues. I think that if a developer wants to build on Greenbelt, then they must pr prove exceptional circumstances and benefit to the community, especially where there are so many brownfield sites. And I, so I probably disagree with my colleague Richard Lyle in, in the points that he made. There's brownfield sites in North Lanarkshire are plenty. Now, this motion is about Faskin, which borders my constituency, eh, the Caron Bro area, where we're, uh, you know, as a side issue, we're also fighting a local incinerator. And I know that Monica Lennon's got debate in that next speech, but which I'll be committed to speak in. I can't go into much detail on that because, as others have said, it's a local government planning stage. Um, but I've already stated my overall position. I think that people um, really need to demonstrate why they would want to build an area and what benefit that would bring to the community as against losing Greenbelt area. But given the close proximity, I will commit to keeping a close watch on developments uh, through the various processes. And I'd like to thank the groups, Dave Faskin and Woodhall, who I know are here, uh, Kathleen, Dr Glenn, Diane and Peter, all who I met coming off the train today, and apologies if I've missed MD. I want to thank you for keeping me up to date with what's been going on. And Alex Neal, who's, uh, whose constituency it's in, uh, sends his uh, appreciation too. He's actually at a funeral this morning. And I'll on my doorstep all these years of asking the Woodhill area. I didn't actually know until I went on my, my, my tour of it that, um, you know, the, the, the actual depth of it, and it is, it is quite a fantastic area. And I've now actually started using it as one of my running routes. So um, I'm not the best runner ever, but I've started to use it. So. So I want to also take some time, presiding officer, on the, the minute or so I've got left to mention the, the steps area, which Margaret Mitchell had mentioned. Um, there's been one decision there, as Margaret Mitchell said, where um, it was, uh, there was a decision taken by the local authority not to allow development, but that's been overturned by the reporter. And there are now two more uh, issues at pre-plan stage. Like Faskin, it's at a stage where it needs to go in front of the local authority first, and quite rightly so. But given the issues there, that is directly in my constituency, and the... Uh, the schools and infrastructure are already struggling to, to cope. I have committed to supporting uh, my constituents there as best I can. And when I see the plans coming in, if, if they get to that stage, then I will uh, object with the council if required and appropriate to do so. And um, I want to make that commitment clear today. In conclusion, presiding officer, we do need more houses. And I'm proud of this government's targets and what we've done. But we also need our green belts for our health and wellbeing. It's our job here as MSPs councillors and others to find that balance and I have every faith in this government and the, the ministerial team delivering it to deliver just that. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I call Monica Lennon. Thank you, presiding officer. And can I begin as a fellow Central Scotland MSP in thanking Graeme Simpson for bringing this motion uh, to the chamber to be debated today. And a big uh, hello and welcome to everyone who's travelled uh, from the local communities to, to be here. Um, it takes a lot of time an effort to engage in the planning process and I say that as someone who uh, is a former town planner and I refer to my members interest. Graeme Simpson declared his love for the, the Greenbelt. Well 
I love planning, I love its contribution to placemaking, not just the great places that it has helped to shape, but also the important part it's played in protecting the environment, the natural environment that we all love and is so important for our health and our well-being and for future generations. But we're here because there's a proposal in front of the community and I guess one of the benefits of the previous uh, Planning Act which was passed in 2006 is that we now have this process where there's that early engagement and communities can get involved at the, the proposal of application notice stage. So there isn't a planning application in front of us yet and I know we can't talk too much about the specific case because the Cabinet Secretary can't get involved in the, the detail of that at this time. But it's good that the community um, can have their say and they certainly have done so. And I think the debate we were having, um, now that we're looking at the planning legislation again, where we were told back in 2006 and, and earlier that if we do this front loading and have this early engagement and work towards maintaining a plan led system, then we will get the right development in the right places. And people will feel that they have a voice, that they have been listened to. Um, and we get away from just accusing local people of being NIMBYs who don't want development and are getting in the way of progress. Now, being a Lanarkshire person myself, um, I know we have a lot of vacant and derelict land in Lanarkshire. We have a lot of brownfield land. We have a big site in Ravenscraig where there's not been an awful lot happening. Happening. So we do have a system in Scotland um, which I believe is pro-development. Over 95% of planning applications are approved. Um, so we have a culture that's very much about making stuff happen. But we have to look at the viability of sites and why brownfield sites are becoming less attractive because we know a big constraint to development is infrastructure costs and we're looking at that in our scrutiny of, of the planning bill. And there's stuff in the planning bill which is, is, is good and is well intentioned, but if we are to be ambitious for our communities right across Scotland, we need a planning system that is transformative. And I'm really concerned about the, the, the lack of resourcing that goes into to planning, um, because all of the people in the public gallery have to pick up the phone to a planning officer. They have to make sure that they're getting a proper hearing. And when we see that 23% of local authority planners, their jobs have disappeared um, in the last few years, then that tells us that maybe our priorities are not quite right. Richard Leonard talked about where power lies. And when I was 16 and I went to university to, to learn to, to study t town planning and some of the debate today has taken me back. So we don't need to go over uh, you know, why we have Greenbelt and why it's important. But I was curious about why development happens, who makes decisions. And I think that's that same curiosity that, that members are applying to our scrutiny of the planning bill. Because environmental justice uh, is not something that is just handed over to local communities. It's a battle, it's a fight. It costs money to challenge planning decisions. It costs money to get professional advice. And developers already, the system's stacked in their favour because they have an army of consultants and experts at their back. And communities don't have any of that. And when you have a development plan that says this kind of stuff shouldn't be happening, then we have to think about what that playing field is and we're asking communities to take on a big fight that isn't of their making so I know my time is up but I'm happy to take the intervention. Uh, I'm afraid you should be closing shortly. It's a four minute speech. Okay. I was happy to take it but I appreciate where, where our time is up. So again I thank Graeme Simpson for bringing the debate to the chamber. I look forward to hearing the response from the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much. I now call Angela Constance to close the Government Cabinet Secretary. Seven minutes or thereabouts. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, can I thank all members for their contributions uh, this uh, lunchtime? I've uh, listened with great interest uh, and to the, the, the detail uh, of the, the, the thought uh, and care that has been given to the uh, speeches made this afternoon. I also want to welcome uh, members of the public uh, to the gallery also. As Mr Simpson acknowledged from the outset and as Ms Lennon, as a former planning professional, acknowledged, uh, I do have to state uh, from the very outset that it would be uh, inappropriate for me as a member of cabinet uh, to comment on the merits of any specific planning case. However, I am very happy to close this debate uh, this afternoon by uh, bringing together some thoughts on the policy issues and the opportunities it raises in relation to both green spaces uh, and community engagement and planning. 
All members have acknowledged that green infrastructure has uh, a great deal to contribute to our quality of life, uh, our health and our well-being. We all agree that green spaces are important to people. The most recent green space use and attitude survey confirms that over 90% of urban Scots say it's important uh, to have green space in their local area. And green networks can be the lifeblood of any village, town or city, contributing to quality of life and health and providing many other benefits like managing flood risk, uh, supporting wildlife uh, and absorbing pollution. And Scotland, I believe, is uh, an environmental uh, leader and the importance of green space is widely recognised in our policy uh, from health to regeneration, early years to planning, biodiversity uh, to climate change. And we have also uh, supported evidence uh, about green space, including uh, the pioneering uh, green space map. And as a government, we've also funded the third state of Scotland's green space report, which gives an up-to-date picture uh, about green space in Scotland. It shows that we can rightly claim to be a nation of green towns and cities, uh, with green space comprising over half of our urban land area. And that's equivalent of a, a tennis court size of publicly accessible uh, green space for everyone living uh, in urban Scotland. And with this wealth of green space through Scottish planning policy, we've set out how planning should protect and promote it uh, as part of successful placemaking. Because we know being able to access high quality green space can improve the health, well-being and the confidence uh, of people uh, and communities. Yes. Secretary. That's it, your microphone. Yes, Ms Lennon. Thank you. Um, one of the issues we've been looking at in terms of the, the planning bill is that the bill doesn't, um, on the face of it, say what is the purpose of planning. So we've heard from some stakeholders that it would be very helpful to have that in the bill because then everyone who's involved in the process knows what is important and, and what we are um, taking into account um, at a very high level in terms of you know, the, the vision for our country and the things in terms of sustainable growth and sustainable development that should be explicit in the, in the bill. Can I just say gently, <laughs> I've let you talk about, it's like having a planning bill debate. It was about green belt, I appreciate this, but it's almost like a, a stage one debate we're having. I just make that comment in passing. Cabinet Secretary. Um, in, in general terms, I think it's very important that uh, people do indeed understand the purpose of planning, the many objectives uh, of planning infrastructure and planning policy and, and the law. Uh, and I think uh, as a government, we will have to look very carefully um, at anything that can be done uh, to help people uh, be able to access the planning system in terms of understanding it. Because there are many misconceptions uh, about you know, the purpose of planning and some of the terminology uh, used. And I'll touch a wee bit uh, on that later. Uh, going back to uh, the issue of the benefits of, of green space, uh, we have seen uh, evidence from the World Health Organization uh, on the benefits of green space, uh, including healthier birth weights, uh, improved mental health, uh, reduced uh, cardiovascular mortality, obesity, and uh, the risk of type 2 uh, diabetes. And recognising the range of benefits that green space offers, uh, we added a new indicator uh, to the National Performance Framework about access uh, to local green space. And we are also supporting projects that enhance green space within communities. Uh, the Central Scotland Green Network, uh, a national development in NP F3 uh, is Europe's largest green space project uh, and is home to uh, three and a half million people. And in our programme for government, uh, we committed to its ongoing delivery and the Scottish Government provides the uh, CSGM Trust with around uh, £950,000 a year uh, to drive its delivery. But as well as protecting green space, uh, we need to plan ahead to deliver uh, the right homes uh, in the right places and many members uh, have made that reflection. Planning should uh, facilitate economic investment uh, that supports jobs uh, and we need to ensure that communities have access to the facilities and the services they need and we support uh, a plan-led system um, to achieve that. And I suppose that touches upon uh, Monica Lennon's point about uh, the many uh, purposes and objectives uh, of planning. The green belts uh, are a tool to help guide the, the future development of our settlements by directing developments to the most appropriate uh, and sustainable locations. And green belt designations and related planning decisions are of course for planning authorities in the first instance, 
However, Scottish plan and policy is clear that for most settlements, uh, a green belt isn't necessary as other policies uh, can provide an appropriate basis for, for direct and development. And there are strong protections in place for green belts uh, across Scotland. But whilst green belt is a well-known planning term, there are some common misconceptions about it. The green belt's purpose is not to prohibit development altogether. It's not intended to protect natural heritage or open space. There are other environmental designations and policies that are available for that. Uh, and of course, it needs to evolve as part of the development plan. Uh, local authorities should keep green belt boundaries under review. And such reviews uh, can support uh, settlement strategies by directing development to the right location uh, and help maintain the, the long-term integrity uh, of the, the green belt. And planning uh, has to make the, the best use of the land that we have available, a point made by a number of speakers. But it has to support development that meets our needs for homes, for jobs, for services. And it can also ensure uh, that future development is designed with existing environmental assets in mind. Uh, new development investment can also provide opportunity to improve access to green space for more people uh, by providing enhanced links. And the way in which the balance is struck is, of course, a matter uh, for local authorities in consultation uh, with communities uh, rather than for this parliament to decide. And this government is working hard to um, improve the planning system uh, and people's trust in it. Uh, with the planning bill, we have an opportunity to create a more streamlined uh, and confident system uh, that makes a real and positive difference uh, to people's lives uh, and their places. And we very much believe that community power uh, is a critical part of the planning process. And it is positive to see communities working together uh, to share their views on how their places uh, should evolve. And by supporting the bill's provisions to create local place plans, uh, we can do our bit uh, to see more of that. Um, I appreciate, presiding officer, that um, as we progress with the planning bill, we will come back uh, to many issues uh, across a range uh, of planning issues, and we would expect to do that time and time again as Parliament goes through its, its appropriate uh, processes. But can I just end by uh, you know, thanking all members uh, for their uh, contributions. There's been uh, a wide range of matters covered. I'm sorry that I can't uh, reflect uh, on them all in the time that's uh, bearing, but it's been um, a good opportunity to hear uh, people's views uh, and also, I hope, a worthwhile uh, opportunity for members of the public uh, to hear uh, MSPs uh, debate uh, some of the intricacies around planning a little bit, but also, uh, more importantly, uh, the benefits of green space. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. That, ends, that concludes the debate, and I suspend this meeting until 2.15.